Since we talked last time about the book of Job with Jordan Monson, I wanted to touch on another translation issue in the book that many people haven't heard of or thought about. This is found in chapter 42, verse 6, where Job is speaking to God after hearing his voice out of the whirlwind. If you're reading the ESV, it sounds like this. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. And then you'll notice this little footnote on the word repent that says, or and am comforted. These are wildly different translations, and the average Bible reader doesn't have the tools to make any sense of it. So let's talk about it. I'm Andrew Case, and this is Working for the Word. Let's go. So let's start again by hearing the verse in question. I'm going to read the verse right before it, verse 5. It says, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. So verse 6, therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes is the typical translation that you're going to find in the majority translations. So for example, if you have the NASB, you're going to hear, therefore I retract and I repent in dust and ashes, KJV, wherefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. And even the Reina Valera 1960 is going to say, por lo tanto me aborrezco y me arrepiento en polvo y ceniza. So the first big question is basically an interpretive one when you get to this verse. The question is, did the Satan at the beginning of the book of Job win the wager or the bet or the argument, whatever you want to call it? So remember, he was challenging Yahweh saying, Job doesn't really trust you because of you. It's just because you've given him so much good stuff and made him so prosperous. And so take that away and then you'll see who he really is. So the question then is, after we've heard Job talk throughout the book in response to his suffering, does he need to repent for what he has said? Is, is there cause for repentance? Has he now responded in a sinful way to this suffering brought upon him by the permission of Yahweh? Does he need to repent for what he has said somehow? That's the big question. So you have to ask yourself, is Elihu, the last friend of Job who speaks, correct in his rebuke of Job? So far in the book, Job has said some really crazy things, very harsh things, very bold things that many people would not be comfortable hearing in church. Even right at the beginning, there's the famous chapter of Job's birthday curse. You know, he curses the day of his birth. He wishes he was never born. He questions why he had to be born. And so somebody might argue, well, a good, righteous man of God would never say those sorts of things. So, of course, it's appropriate that Job repents at the end of the book, right? Well, what does the narrator actually say when he weighs in on what Job has said? Well, in the very next verse, Job 42, 7, it says, After Yahweh had spoken these words to Job, Yahweh said to Eliphaz the Temanite, My anger burns against you and against your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. So he doesn't say, as my servant Elihu has, but rather, as my servant Job has. And in case we missed it the first time, he says it again in the next verse. Now, therefore, take seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job and offer up a burnt offering for yourselves, and my servant Job shall pray for you. For I will accept his prayer not to deal with you according to your folly. For you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. So if we believe the inspired narrator of Job, what do we make of this? Why is Job repenting? What is he repenting of if he's spoken of God what is right the whole time? 
and he's not required to offer a sacrifice like his friends are. So this is a really thorny issue that we need to dig into really deeply. So let me read this verse to you in Hebrew first, for those of you who can follow along. So it says, Alken emas v'nachamti al afar va'efer. So there's basically three elements that we need to tackle in this verse. First, we have to figure out what emas means. What does that mean exactly? Does that mean I despise myself or can it mean something else? Then v'nihamdi, what does that mean? Does it mean repent or does it mean what the ESV says in the footnote or I am comforted? And then we need to talk about these two words, dust and ashes. So the first time I tackled this problem was about 10 years ago when I was teaching through the book of Job to 9 and 10 year olds in Sunday school. And when we came to this passage, I ended up spending about 40 hours researching this one verse to try to get to the bottom of the issue because it was important, right? You can't really figure out what is the purpose of Job, the whole book, whether Yahweh was right or whether the Satan was right, if you don't get this verse correct, in my opinion. Now, if you're wondering, the Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia, the BHS, doesn't have any footnotes on this verse in the apparatus, which means that it doesn't flag any particular textual variance. But keep in mind that this, in this version, it's selective. The BHS is selective, and it doesn't mean that there isn't some disagreement between versions. So, for instance, the Septuagint and the Masoretic text. So, I went looking in the preliminary and interim report on the HOTTP. Now, in a past episode, I talked about what the HOTTP is. So, it's the Hebrew Old Testament Text Project. And it was a project designed way back in the day to help missionary Bible translators with hard decisions on on textual criticism. So, the idea was that those without expertise in the science of weighing the witness evidence for different variants in manuscripts would be able to have access to the opinions of a a really smart committee who had that special specialization and expertise, and they would weigh in with their opinions on thousands of textual problems to help people navigate all of that world. Now, this was originally all done in French, and then an English translation was published as the preliminary and interim report. So it wasn't the final report, but it was still something to help people in the meanwhile while everything was being compiled and finalized. And so this was published in multiple volumes, which are actually now really hard to find and pretty expensive, unfortunately. So when I looked at volume three of the preliminary and interim report, on page 162, you can see what their suggestion is. So that this committee tackled this whole issue of what does emas mean? So aleph mem, aleph samech. So first of all, what does this root ma'as mean? If we look at some of the Hebrew lexicons like halot or bdb, the first meaning is to refuse or reject and then uh, in the Nafal, to be rejected or despised. And this is the most common use. It's used about 70 times throughout the Hebrew Bible. Now, if we look at the Septuagint, it's really interesting because the translator didn't seem to know what to do with that one word. So he translated it with two words. So he says, therefore, I despise myself and am wasted away. And then the second part, he doesn't mention repentance. He says, and I think of myself as dust and ashes. So that's an interesting variant right there. Uh, Another way you could translate what the Septuagint says in the first part is, I despise myself and I melt. Now, if we go to the Dead Sea Scrolls, we have 11 QTG Job, a targum of Job found in Qumran that's an Aramaic translation of the Hebrew book of Job. And so, this is what it says, I am poured out and dissolved, very similar to the Greek. And 
it's not uncommon for this Aramaic translation of Job to use two Aramaic words or lexemes to render one Hebrew verb. And the same is true for the Septuagint, where we have a lot of evidence, a lot of documentation showing how the translators often used two words in Greek to translate one word in Hebrew. So I realized that I left you hanging on what the preliminary and interim report said about emas. So here's what they said. They suggested that the best way to read this based on the evidence is either as I am overwhelmed or I withdraw, and then in brackets, charges. So you may or may not be convinced by the experts on that committee. That's okay. But they do say that it is a possibility to translate it as I am overwhelmed, which I find compelling based on the stuff we're going to look at now. So now we arrive at the big question, the big footnote in the ESV. Does this mean I am comforted or does it mean I repent? So once again, our word in Hebrew is venihamti. So we're dealing with the root naham. It's a first person, nifil, vav consecutive perfect. And here's where things get a bit surprising. Okay, so... One of the best ways to decide what does a word mean, if you're on the, the edge, you're in a dilemma, is to just run a search and see how this word is used in context every time it occurs in that book of the Bible. So let me take you on a tour of every single occurrence of Naham, the root Naham, in the book of Job. Okay? First, Job 2.11, B. They made an appointment together to come to show him sympathy and comfort him. So there's Naham, translated as comfort. Job 7.13, when I say, my bed will comfort me, my couch will ease my complaint, dot, dot, dot. Once again, Naham, translated as comfort. Job 16.2, I have heard many such things. Miserable comforters are you all. Job 21, 34. How then will you comfort me with empty nothings? There is nothing left of your answers but falsehood. Job 29, 25. I chose their way and sat as chief, and I lived like a king among his troops, like one who comforts mourners. Job 42.11, just a few verses down from 42.6, the same chapter. It says, Then came to him all his brothers and sisters and all who had known him before and ate bread with him in his house, and they showed him sympathy and comforted him for all the evil that Yahweh had brought upon him. And each of them gave him a piece of money and a ring of gold. So what I've read to you is how the ESV itself chose to translate this root Naham every time it occurred in the book of Job, except for 42.6. So it's crazy that even within the same chapter, only five verses later, Naham is used again with the clear contextual meaning of comfort. So it's significant in the structure of the book That it begins and ends chiastically with comforting. So what I'm talking about is that first his friends come to comfort him at the beginning. And then it ends with him actually finding real comfort from Yahweh. So Yahweh becomes the ultimate comforter. And the redeemer, the goel that Job hoped for against hope in Job 19. I'm assuming most people are familiar with Job 19, beautiful chapter, and we write songs about it. So this is Job 19.25, for I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth. So let's look at a parallel of this Redeemer theme or design pattern in the Hebrew Bible. So we see the Redeemer, the Goel, played out by Boaz in the book of Ruth. So when Boaz 
takes an interest in this Moabite woman and begins to treat her well, how does she respond? She says, I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, literally spoken to the heart of your servant, though I am not one of your servants. So the same root, Naham, you have comforted me. So that's really interesting. Now you may be wondering, okay, well then how is Job comforted by this crazy theophany of Yahweh who has just really in, in a lot of ways humbled him and put him in his place? You know, where were you, Job, when I laid the foundations of the earth and all of that? How can that be comforting? We'll get to that. We'll get to that. But for now, let me just say the role of comforting redeemer, comforting redeemer, two important words here, is not foreign to Yahweh and the rest of the Old Testament. So think about this. These verses that I'm going to read to you use the root Naham to describe Yahweh's comfort as well as other significant uses of the word. So here we go. Isaiah 12, 1. You will say in that day, I will give thanks to you, O Yahweh, for though you were angry with me, your anger turned away that you might comfort me. And then a famous one, Psalm 23, verse 4. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now, of course, there's been so many oceans of ink spilled on Psalm 23, but I will just comment that, you know, this is a shepherd, shepherd imagery. And so the rod and staff of a shepherd, what does it do? Well, he usually has to hit the sheep. He has to strike the sheep so that the sheep will get back on the path, will know where to go. The rod and staff of a shepherd is not some cuddly blanket or stuffed animal to make them feel the typical kind of warm, fuzzy comfort that we think of in the West. So keep that in mind. Isaiah 51, 12. I, I am he who comforts you. There it is again. Same root. Who are you that you are afraid of man who dies? of the son of man who is made like grass. So isn't that interesting? You have Yahweh saying, I am he who comforts you. And then the same sentence or the same verse, he's kind of rebuking the the hearer and saying, who are you that you are afraid of man who dies? Like get back in your place. Very similar to how he spoke to Job. Isaiah 51, three. For Yahweh comforts, Zion, there it is again. He comforts all her waste places and makes her wilderness like Eden, her desert like the garden of Yahweh. Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving and the voice of song. Isaiah 66, 13. As one whom his mother comforts, so I will comfort you. You shall be comforted in Jerusalem. Ezekiel 14, 22, but behold, some survivors will be left in it, sons and daughters who will be brought out. Behold, when they come out to you and you see their ways and their deeds, you will be comforted. ESV actually says consoled here for the disaster that I have brought upon Jerusalem for all that I have brought upon it. Isaiah 49, 13. Sing for joy, O heavens, and exult, O earth. Break forth, O mountains, into singing, for Yahweh has comforted his people and will have compassion on his afflicted. Same word there, Naham. All right, then Isaiah 40, verse 1. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Lamentations 116. For these things I weep, My eyes flow with tears, for a comforter is far from me, one to revive my spirit. My children are desolate, for the enemy has prevailed. So there's 
there's a book. It's one of the most similar books as you can get to the book of Job. It's the same kind of great sorrow that's being expressed in the book of Lamentations and desire for a comforter, need for a comforter. Zechariah 1.17 Cry out again, thus says Yahweh of armies, my cities shall again overflow with prosperity and Yahweh will again comfort Zion and again choose Jerusalem. Now you're probably thinking, okay, yes, but how can somebody be comforted in dust and ashes? That's where you repent, right? You repent in dust and ashes. Well, that is a very tricky confusion, and I fell for it. I think a lot of people fall for it. You see, in the Bible, you repent in sackcloth and ashes. You don't repent in dust and ashes. Dust and ashes is another unique phrase. There are actually only two other places where we have afar va'efer, as a couplet, both refer to a human being's insignificance or desolation, namely that man is born from dust and will end as ashes and return to the dust. So the first occurrence we find in Genesis 18.27, where Abraham says, Behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord. I who am but dust and ashes. The other couplet occurs in Job 30, 19, when Job laments, God has cast me into the mire, and I have become like dust and ashes. So, the best way to read Job 42, 6 would be to remain faithful to the meaning of the dust and ashes hendiatus or couplet as it occurs elsewhere in the Old Testament. So how do we put all this together? It must be significant that Job, at a low point of despair, describes himself as dust and ashes and having been cast into the mire by God, when at the end and climax of the book, God lifts him up out of the mire by showing his awesome grandeur. This is the opposite approach of the carnal mind, which would have God lift a man out of the dumps by flattery and sweet talk, right? Exalting man's importance and greatness. But God knows that such an approach brings no depth of healing or relief. And man is truly lifted out of the muck and the mire when he is reminded of his own frailty, insignificance, and littleness next to a massive God. So self-forgetfulness before the vastness of God's beauty is what comforts a man from having become like dust and ashes. So, Right before dust and ashes, we find the preposition al, and it's most likely used here in an oppositional sense, from, despite, over, against. Uh, Walt Keon O'Connor lists three examples of this usage. We can find it in Exodus 20, verse 3, Psalm 81, 6, Job 34, 6. So let me read Job 34, 6 to you as Walt Key and O'Connor translate it and give this example. So in Hebrew, it's al mishpati achazev. So you hear that al preposition right at the beginning, right? So they translate this as, despite my being right, I am considered a liar. So that first part is, Despite is what they're translating all as in English. So this particular usage is not as common as the locative or spatial usage of all, which is usually like upon or against. But it is significant that it does appear in that sense in the book of Job. And so that's how I would read it. I would read it as, from or despite or over against. 
So putting this all together, my translation of Job 42.6 would be, Therefore I am overwhelmed and comforted from dust and ashes. Once again, Therefore I am overwhelmed and comforted from dust and ashes. So if we back that up in the context, he's just heard the powerful voice of God out of the whirlwind. He's seen this display of immense majesty. And then he says in verse 5, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I am overwhelmed and comforted from dust and ashes. Now, maybe that's not the best translation in English. Probably needs a little fine tuning. But you get the idea. Job is now simultaneously overwhelmed by this vision of God and also comforted in the midst of his feeling so mortal and weak as dust and ashes. Anyway, I hope that's helpful. It was a joy meditating on that with you. So we'll wrap it up here. Working for the Word is a podcast where we believe that the Bible is a unified, God-breathed, God-centered, hope-giving book sweeter than honey and pointing to Jesus. And this podcast exists ultimately to help us all treasure the Bible more and go deeper into it and ultimately become more like the man of Psalm 1.